Hey, welcome along. We have another uh, batch of questions submitted by members of the Mark Stein Club from around the planet. Uh, some of them are all on the usual doom and gloom stuff, but uh, a couple of them are actually quite jolly. So there's that to look forward to. The first one uh, comes from Catherine. And Catherine says, Mark, have you ever spoken with Tommy Robinson? And uh, yes, I have very briefly uh, for just a, a minute or two uh, at the European Parliament in Brussels of all places. And for Americans uh, and others who don't know who Tommy Robinson is, he's one of these uh, big anti-jihad guys in the United Kingdom, a very prominent person uh, resisting the Islamization of Britain. And yes, it'd be nice if, uh, you know, someone like Margaret Atwood uh, or J.K. Rowling would uh, take up uh, that baton, but you never get to pick uh, the people who take up these causes. And in Britain and in Europe, uh, people who do, do so at great personal cost. And the story of Tommy Robinson is the story of equivalent figures uh, across the continent, really. Uh, it's fascinating to me that they will do anything to keep Tommy Robinson in jail, to put him in jail and to keep him in jail. Uh, if you look at the fellows who pulled off the attacks in Manchester and London, they literally couldn't get arrested. Nothing they did. Uh, the Manchester guy was fingered by French intelligence, Ita Italian intelligence, and uh, U.S. intelligence, 5 and they still did nothing uh, about him. Uh, the London guy was actually featured in a Channel 4 documentary made by my old friends at Mentorn on the jihadis next door. He had the starring role in the jihadi next door, and he couldn't get arrested. But they find any excuse to arrest Tommy Robinson. Uh, an anti-Islamization demonstration of his overran the permitted time by three minutes. Three minutes. So they arrested him. Uh, and every time they arrest him, uh, they uh, send him to jail in a heavily uh, Muslim part of the jail. You'd almost think the British state uh, was hoping that... Uh, some guy would kill him in prison. It's, a, it's extraordinary to me. The less they do about any of the real threats, the more they harass the people who point out the threats. Uh, that's the situation that Tommy Robinson is in. And as I said, it's the same thing that happens uh, to equivalent people all over Europe. They can't stop a guy who's been fighting from ISIS from coming into the country and pulling off a terrorist attack. But if a Tommy Robinson protest overruns by three minutes, boom, he goes to jail. So I've met him. He's a charismatic figure. He's a smart figure. And if you doubt me on that, there's a guy called Jeremy Paxman. He used to be the big hotshot interviewer at the BBC. And he's a little off his game these days. And if you want to see how badly he is off his game, uh, look at the uh, clip from BBC Newsnight a couple of years ago where he interviewed Tommy Robinson. When you have bombs going off, when you have uh, stabbings, when you have the decapitation of soldiers in the street, when you have people being mown down by cars, there's a lot of anger. And the British government doesn't want to do anything about the people doing any of these things, but they have to find a conduit for the anger. Uh, so the idea is you can have a two-minute hate, an approved two-minute hate against the guy who points out the things you ought to be angry about. And that's the role Tommy Robinson plays. Uh, but he had the better of uh, Jeremy Paxman in this Newsnight interview. Uh, Malcolm writes from down the road in New Hampshire. Uh, Mark, I appreciate the honesty in your statement that our generation has so screwed things up. I said this uh, welcoming a 15-year-old, uh, Natalie, from Billings, Montana, into the Mark Stein Club. She's, she got a, a club membership for her 16th birthday at the end of this month. 
And I said, our generation has so screwed things up, we need to unscrew it so that uh, Natalie's generation doesn't curse us, dig up our bones and curse them uh, years from now. Uh, I appreciate the honesty in your statement, our generation has so screwed things up. I often get frustrated with the younger generation, but they grew up in the world we created. I live in New Hampshire too, and as a pastor in a small city, I see the opioid crisis up close. It's a result of the hopelessness that godless relativists in the media and educational system have pushed for 50 years. Other negatives are the student loan debt and divorce these young people have experienced. Things went wrong on our generation's watch. We have to take responsibility. I pray it's not too late. God is sovereign and in control at all times. He can turn things around if people humble themselves. Our hope is in him. You are helping, though, brother, says uh, Pastor Malcolm. And I'll come to the God bit uh, a bit later. But I, I, I want to uh, approach it in uh, secular terms, if you like, uh, for, for, the, for the first part. Uh, every big action a society makes has unintended consequences. That goes without saying. Every change you make has unintended consequences. When you change as much as we have changed in the last half century, when you change uh, the social patterns of millennia in nothing flat, when you change everything, well, not everything, but when you change so much so fast, uh, then Quite simply, a, a society can become unmoored. If you look at the great age of invention, the 19th century, what was remarkable about that, it was a period of tremendous technological advance, technological change. And yet at the same time, they kept their social structures uh, intact, uh, which is actually a really difficult feat when you look back and think about, uh, about it. We've now changed everything as I said, in the last 50 years. Uh, women have entered the uh, workplace in extraordinary numbers. We've had automation and computers, which have eliminated uh, entire industries. We've had the, uh, a lot of middle-class industries, like being a travel agent, for example, uh, or even being a bank clerk, uh, now that there's ATMs and whatnot. Meanwhile, a lot of the blue-collar jobs are all done out of sight somewhere in, in the third world. Along with that, we've had uh, sexual liberation. Uh, we've had the extension of education so that people don't finish school now until halfway through their 20s. And coming back the other way, we've introduced the concept of uh, retirement, a uh, concept entirely unknown a, a century ago. A century ago, you were a child until you were about 13. Then you were an adult. Then you died. That was it. Two phases in life. We've now introduced the idea that the last three decades of life should be a kind of uh, long holiday weekend, and we've extended school uh, until uh, yeah, mid to late 20s. And so being an adult is that tiny little space in between, which means that people have smaller children, smaller families. And they have, instead of having three, four children, they have one boutique designer child at the age of 38. Uh, and so because of the shortage of manpower, large parts of the world, of uh, the developed world, Europe's imported the Muslims to be the children they couldn't be bothered having themselves. The United States imported uh, unskilled Latin American peasants to be the children they couldn't be bothered having themselves. Uh, if you just have one child at the age of 38, it's a different kind of thing. It's... Uh, uh, so we've had phenomena like helicopter parents, uh, the ones who were so terrified of their one designer child, they won't let little Junior out of their sight until he's 18, 19, 23, whatever. Well, at the same time, with the collapse of working class America, uh, you and the rise in divorce and all the rest of it, and the rise in out of wedlock marriage, you have people being raised in total social dysfunction. Uh, and then uh, with the elimination of uh, work uh, as the central purpose of life, something that gives life dignity, with the destigmatization of life, 
and the of, of un destigmatization of unemployment and the introduction of uh, things like welfare, uh, you, you have people who are vaguely dissatisfied, uh, have no sense of purpose, and it's very easy to turn to heroin and meth and all the rest of it. As I said, we've changed. We changed too much too fast. And we did it very carelessly. And it's very difficult. It's much easier to wreck the joint than it is to put it back together again. And that's something that, uh, that's something that gives me pause and it gives Pastor Malcolm pause. And as I said, I get to the God part of in a moment, and that's via this letter from Ken Cook, uh, who goes, Hi, Mark. Lately, I've been telling people that the West is so post-Christian that even Christians don't mention Christ. How is it that no commentary, mainstream or conservative, after years of Islamic terrorism, has ever discussed the issue from a Christian perspective? The West was built on the Judeo-Christian ideology and ethics and all our established societal structures and our general way of thinking derived from these, and yet they are never mentioned, even when confronted with an almost diametrically opposed theology. This is the problem. It's not an economic or societal or governmental problem. It is a spiritual problem. And if the West does not find their faith again in the Almighty God, then the battle is lost. So my question is, why don't you interview some leading Christian leaders who may mention Christ for a real perspective on the spiritual upheaval we are seeing? That's Ken Cook. <clears throat> and you're right. I'll, tell, I'll answer the easy part first. The reason I don't interview Christian leaders, so-called, uh, is for the most part because they're an unimpressive bunch. They've been absolutely silent, for example, on the genocide against Christians, the confessional cleansing that is going on throughout uh, North Africa, East Africa, the Middle East, uh, Pakistan at the moment, where Christians, uh, believing Christians at church are slaughtered and so-called Christian leaders in so-called Christendom from the Pope down have very little to say about it. The Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the various uh, Episcopal bishops and whatnot in the United States are largely silent on that. Uh, and that's one reason why I have very little desire to interview them. On the, on the spiritual whole in the West, um, I've been reading uh, Douglas Murray's book, The Strange Death of Europe. And at the end of it, he, he actually has a chapter dealing with that, uh, that there is something empty and purposeless in Europe. And that is the vacuum into which uh, Islam has poured. And he and I have met people over the years, and they all tell, uh, particularly European women, uh, people who uh, came from what one might loosely call Christian background in countries where there is a nominal state church, like the Church of England. And as Douglas said, all the stories are the same. You know, the, 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 the girl finds herself, she's 27, she's off her head in some nightclub, she's roaring drunk, and uh, she staggers outside and she's vomiting uh, on the sidewalk. And, and at some point she goes, is this all there is to life? Uh, my life has no meaning. I feel terrible. Uh, I'm treated terribly. I, I sleep with everyone and I'm treated like garbage and uh, Western world, uh, the contemporary life isn't working for me. And they turn to Islam. And the rate of conversion uh, in Britain and in Europe to Islam is high enough to be disturbing. And Douglas goes into quite some detail about the likelihood of enough Europeans recovering their faith. And I don't mean by that that they suddenly become uh, what they used to call in England God-botherers, where they become uh, rather uh, tiresomely pious about everything. All they have to be uh, is, as, uh, as the old joke has it, uh, when the Jehovah's Witness knocks on the door, oh, no, we're not uh, very religious around here. We're all Church of England. All they have to be is as religious as uh, the English were 50, 60, 70 years ago. 
They know the hymns. They know the big time psalms. They recognize a biblical quotation. They don't ask for Whitney Houston singing, I will always love you as their funeral hymn. That's all they have to do. But without it, without a, any kind of transcendent uh, organizing principle to society, you have contemporary Europe. Every functioning society is a compact between the past, the present, and the future. And a transcendent meaning, which is almost always provided by religion, uh, is what binds those three elements together. And if you don't have a transcendent meaning, and I say this with respect to my atheist friends, uh, because even atheists, if they think about it, are part of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And even a, an honest atheist, if he thinks about it, will acknowledge that the great achievements of our civilization, the great artistic achievements, the great music, the great painting, the great architecture, uh, if you take religion out of that, you take away all the great paintings, you take away all the great requiems and a thousand other lesser uh, compositions inspired by God. You take away the cathedrals, the greatest achievements in architecture built to glorify God. And you take away every crummy little European village that is built around a church on a village green at the center of community life as all those villages are laid out. Europe has, Europe is, is like Goethe's Faust right now. It's living in the moment. It's living in the moment. And the moment will pass and something else will come along. And while they're living in the moment, what's coming along is Islam. Because whether you like it or not, uh, for all these drunk slattens uh, waking up face down in their own vomit uh, after a Saturday night bender in god awful uh, outside god awful nightclubs in god awful provincial towns, uh, who decide to straighten out their life and find Islam, uh, something will fill the void. And what's filling the void right now is Islam. And Europeans would be better advised to do what Michel Welbeck's uh, narrator uh, tries to do in his novel Submission uh, and try and find their way back uh, to some kind of faith, to some kind of faith in something. Let's take another. Oh, this is on the same thing. Colin, uh, about our generation screwing it up. Our generation did not screw it up, Mark. This was a transgenerational effort by the elites drunk on the total power that they exercised during and after World War II and stupefyingly convinced of the righteousness of their cause. From the UN, through Jean Monnet's European lies, LBJ's corruption of the black American family, and continuing to the present climate fraud. Uh, this clique has been working to homogenize the world. These people have committed the crime of the century. We are witnessing the end of a great civilization because the elites knew and know better than we the people. I should just clarify what I meant when I said that our generation had screwed things up for Colin and anyone else. Uh, by our generation, I didn't mean, you know, boomers versus uh, Gen X, versus the greatest generation, versus millennials. I meant everyone older than 15-year-old Natalie. All the way back uh, to the Great War one century ago, because the great loss of Western civilization's belief in itself occurred in the trenches uh, on the Western Front during the First World War. And almost all the pathologies in our society that have hollowed out and undermined the West uh, have their origin in, in the fatal, lack, uh, fatal loss of self-confidence uh, that emerged in the wake of the Great War one century ago. So I'm referring to everyone from all those generations. It's not a, we all bear our share of the blame. And the only reason I mention the, the generations is because every generation it gets worse. The 60s radicals at least knew what they were rejecting. Like, uh, as I mentioned in my piece on the closing of the American mind, 
uh, the uh, music critic at the London Times who compared the Beatles with Mahler, and everyone was uh, taken aback by that at the time. Well, to be able to compare the Beatles with Mahler, you have to know about Mahler, and that guy did. And that was the same with all the, all the 60s radicals. They'd had a conventional Western education. They knew the inheritance they were rejecting. We now have a situation where uh, the students at our universities don't even know. They've been raised in total ignorance of their civilizational inheritance. And more to the point, their teachers have no idea of their civilizational inheritance. So it's getting worse and worse and worse with every generation, like pale photocopies of pale photocopies of pale photocopies. Uh, and that's my only point on that generational thing. Uh, let's, uh, oh yes, sir. <laughs> we can't, man cannot live on civilizational collapse alone. Jamie Marsh, Stratham, New Hampshire, uh, says, Mark, if you could put your defense of Western civilization aside for a minute, I'm curious about your thoughts and any anecdotes you might have on the band, the police. I grew up a huge fan, loved the lyrics, the punk reggae beats, and always loved the three-man band concept. Uh, Frontman bassist, lead guitar drummer. <laughs> That's J.B. Marsh in Stratham, New Hampshire. I loved the early uh, police, all the uh, message in a bottle, uh, uh, Roxanne, uh, don't, what is it, don't stand so close to me, uh, walking on the moon, uh, and of course the masterpiece, Every Breath You Take. And I once uh, found myself uh, on, after some terrible BBC show, sitting on the sofa next to Sting. And I said I'd always wanted to do an album uh, of police songs, but with big swinging big band arrangements. And I was going to call it song. I had the title. I was going to call it songs for stinging lovers. And I thought sting might quite like the idea, but in fact, the color drained from his cheek and he went to the men's room for about an hour and a half. Uh, so much, so much for that. But in fact, I did, I haven't done it, but I did do one of the songs, uh, every breath you take, uh, which I, I, uh, I haven't released. Uh, or I, I, I remember the reason I didn't release it because it's got, uh, if you remember that song, uh, the, the very high notes, um, see my poor heart break. It gets way up in there. And it's very difficult, that bit. Uh, but I haven't, uh, haven't released that one. But we had a couple of uh, guys on the session who'd actually played with Sting. And they had a good time doing this really swinging arrangement of Every Breath You Take. And uh, one of them said to me, oh, he'll hate it now. But you wait. In 10 years' time, this will be the arrangement he's using at Vegas. So I, I, got, uh, I, I, have a soft spot for, I have a soft spot for Sting. And he has very good taste in the... Uh, in the cover songs he does, as the young people uh, say. Um, uh, let's have a, let's have a, uh, where, where are we? Oh, let's have a, should we have another music question? Uh, yeah, okay, this is from Ed Tonry. And he said, uh, I get the idea you could ask any question, so this is what he wants to ask. A long time back, I watched some PBS fundraising show when big bands were popular again. They played a live video, probably from the 40s, of a big band playing a song called, I think, Low Man on the Totem Pole. You know more about music than anyone I know, so maybe you can tell me who played that song. I've tried Googling it, but the phrase is too common. Uh, but that's the main line in the song, Ed Tonry. This is the number you are thinking of. It's not called Low Man on the Totem Pole. It's got a much better title than that. Uh, from 1942, 75 years ago, bottom man on the totem pole. Take it away, Glenn Gray and his Casaloma Orchestra. I'm the bottom man on the totem pole. I can't move round to save my soul. If I should slip, I'd be in a hole. Cause I'm the bottom man on the totem pole. The boys upstairs look down with glee My back is breaking as you can see But when the girls walk by they envy me Cause I'm the bottom man, the bottom The bottom, uh, the great Glenn Gray and his Casaloma Orchestra uh, just for Ed Tonry and uh, Bottom Man on the Totem Pole. And Ed is probably wondering who wrote that. Was that uh, Cole Porter? Was it Irving Berlin? No, it was uh, Frank Ryerson 
and Grady Watts. And that is a great number. What I like about it, bottom man on the totem pole, is it's illegal now because obviously it's outrageous cultural appropriation. And we like to think of ourselves as uh, your one-stop shop for cultural appropriation. Uh, and that's a twofer because not only is Glenn Gray appropriating Native American culture, uh, but the very name of his band, the Casa Loma Orchestra, is appropriating Hispanic culture. So that's two hate crimes for the price of one. And what a great finale. We'll see you next time.